Amongst all crimes, kidnapping has to be one of the most pernicious. The deliberate abduction of someone and then keeping them away from their loved ones in a state of perpetual dread as to what might happen must be truly terrifying. Not to mention the ongoing impact on their nearest and dearest, forever hoping for the best yet fearing the worst. I'm going to relate to you the facts relating to one kidnapping, that of Sherry Papini. Once you've had a chance to hear those facts, I'll then go through an alternative version of events that will make you question everything and turn what you think on its head. A missing person. Let's start at the beginning. The morning of November the 22nd, 2016 in Redding, California. That morning at about 10.30 a.m., Sherry Papini, who was 34 at the time, texted her husband Keith, asking him if he would be home for lunch. He would not on that day, and this is the last time we hear from Sherry for weeks. Keith returned home from work at around 5.30pm, expecting to be greeted by his wife and kids as normal. He learned shortly thereafter that his kids were still at daycare. Something wasn't right. Sherry would normally have picked them up by now, and he would have expected them to be at home. He used the find my phone feature to track down his wife's whereabouts and the location was identified by him as being on the mountain gate trail about 1.5 kilometers from their home. He went to the location and there he found a phone just off the track. Detectives later confirmed that several strands of Sherry's long blonde hair were tangled up in the earbud cords. There was actually something odd about the way he found the phone. It didn't appear to have been thrown away. Instead, the earbud cords have been wrapped neatly around the phone and the phone itself seemed to have been propped up on some thicker grass. It was almost as if they'd been placed there to be found. When Keith relayed this to detectives, he said he found it strange. It wasn't long before Keith phoned the police, in fact, only around 5.50, about 20 minutes to a half hour after he returned home. Hello, can I help you? Hello? Yeah, um, so uh, I just got home from work and uh, my wife wasn't there, which is unusual, and my kids should have been there by now from like daycare. So I was like, oh, maybe she went on a walk. Um, I couldn't find her, so I called the, the daycare to see what time she picked up the kids. The kids were never picked up, so I got freaked out, so I hit like the Find My iPhone app thing, and it said that her it showed her phone like at our end of our driveway. We don't have really good service. Okay. Uh, not the end of our driveway, but the end of our street. But she just drove down there and I saw her phone with her headphones because she started running again. And it, her, I found her phone and it's got like hair ripped out of it, like in the headphones. So I'm like totally freaking out thinking like somebody okay, like what's your, grabbed her. Okay, what's your address? Some neighbors later volunteered that they had seen Sherry jogging along Sunrise Drive at around noon on that day. Her clothing was described as typically athletic gear which would be expected to be worn by somebody jogging, and she didn't appear to be carrying anything like a bag or a rucksack. No one saw her getting into a car either forcibly or otherwise, although the houses in that area are set back from the road somewhat, and it is possible for either scenario to have happened without anybody noticing. It became a sensation and made national news. Sherry was petite, good looking, and gone. People started to look at the obvious places for a suspect, in this case Keith, her husband. He however was ruled out quite early as being involved on that day because people had seen Sherry after Keith was confirmed as being at work. There was further confirmation that he didn't leave work until after 5pm and also in the days after Sherry's disappearance he passed a polygraph test. Keith then started a GoFundMe campaign online and some people at that time did criticise him for being perhaps a bit too eager to collect the money. But despite this, the police had ruled him out within a week of Sherry's disappearance. The police did make the statement at one point that they weren't actually sure if this was an abduction. Perhaps Sherry had run away for whatever reason and was just lying low. Keith and Sherry's family made multiple appearances in the news over the next 22 days appealing for help and information that might lead to Sherry's discovery. 
Now to find out what actually happened to Sherry, you'll need to go through with me what initially transpired. Sherry Papini found. Nothing was seen or heard from Sherry until Thanksgiving Day on November the 24th, 2016, when Sherry was found nearly 150 miles south of where she was last seen. Her discovery was odd. About 4.30am on that day, police received a number of 911 calls claiming sight of a woman in the middle of I-5. There was a mix of reporting with some people saying she was running around and some people saying that she was just standing there. This was the first sight of Sherry for 22 days. A concerned truck driver had pulled over to help Sherry and when police arrived they found Sherry with the truck driver but looking decidedly dishevelled and clearly not well. She had a number of injuries including what would later be discovered to be a brand that had been marked on her back on her right shoulder. That's right, a brand. The brand itself was indistinguishable in terms of what letters or mark it was supposed to be or represent, but it is important and we'll come back to this later. Not much about her injuries was released to the press and this would be key in the verification process when assessing stories that would later be told. In an affidavit that has since been released to the public, she was described as being heavily battered. Now we can use the affidavit to present a storyline of facts as follows. Sherry had a chain around her waist that one arm was bound to, with additional bindings around her other wrist and each ankle. She was then transported to Woodland Hospital where she underwent several physical examinations. She appeared to have lost a considerable amount of weight and her long blonde hair had been cut much shorter. She had been branded on her right shoulder. Sherry's nose was swollen, she had bruises on her face, brushes on her left arm and left upper inner thigh, as well as other parts of her body. There were ligature marks on her wrists and ankles, burns on her left forearm and bruising on her pelvis and the fronts of both legs. The affidavit goes on to say that on examination it appeared that Sherry hadn't been sexually abused and Sherry herself said she hadn't been abused in that way by her captors. Sherry herself told federal law enforcement officers that she had been abducted by two Hispanic women at gunpoint and taken away in a dark coloured SUV. She said that the SUV containing the two Hispanic women first drove past her then backed up when she saw her jogging up the road. One of the women had on sunglasses and Sherry believed she said something like, can you help me? Sherry walked towards the woman who opened the door of the vehicle to show Sherry she had a gun, which she described as a little revolver. The woman told Sherry to put her phone down and Sherry recalled the woman said something to the effect of, we don't want to kill you. Sherry put down her phone and got into the SUV. She was then held captive by these two women for the next 22 days until one of them decided to release her. Now these were the composite sketches of the woman which were released to the media at that time. No apparent motive was established although there was some speculation that it could have been a human trafficking incident of some sort. Now not much happened officially in the public eye at least for some time. However, the press managed to identify a blog that had been written apparently by Sherry under her maiden name in 2007. This made allegations that she was picked on by Hispanics at her school and as she put it for being white, drug free and proud of her heritage. It went on to say words to the effect that she was standing behind skinheads, metaphorically at least. Now this racist rant along with her description of her alleged abusers as Hispanic did start to raise some public suspicions. The next significant public disclosure came when it was announced that when Sherry was found there was DNA from an unknown female on her body and from an unknown man on her clothes, in other words not her husband's DNA. Well for some time that was all we knew, nothing much more was learned by the public. However, there was a lot more going on behind the scenes in terms of an ongoing investigation that was not made public. What was being discovered appeared to cast some doubt on the abduction theory. But to find out more about that, you will need to listen to the next section of this narrative. The Initial Investigation 
We are very ecstatic to report that Sherry Papini has been located and has been reunited with her husband and family on this day of Thanksgiving. I'm happy to say that Sherry is now safe and she has been treated at a area hospital outside of Shasta County and for non-life-threatening injuries. So to recap a little bit, at about 4.30 this morning, Shasta County Sheriff's Office was notified that Sherry Papini had been located. We learned that she was released by her captor on a rural road near I-5 in Yolo County. She was bound with restraints, but was able to summon from a passing uh, help from a passing motorist on I-5 near County Road 17, again in Yolo, about northern Yolo County. While Sherry was still missing, the FBI were called in, and one of the first things they did was a forensic review of Sherry's phone. It wasn't long before they discovered the contact numbers of two men in her contact list that were actually listed with fake women's names. Now this clearly raised a red flag, and so both men were investigated. The first man lived in Michigan, and Sherry had met him in 2011 when she was out of town on business and it transpired that he and Sherry had spent a weekend together. And this was while Sherry was still married to Keith. The affidavit doesn't say what happened during the weekend, so you'll have to surmise that for yourself. However, the man and Sherry did keep in touch with flirtatious emails for several years afterwards. What aroused suspicion was that he actually had a business trip planned for California in November 2016 and that he and Sherry had made plans to meet up. After extensive reviews of his itineraries and after visiting his house where Sherry could potentially have been being kept, he was ruled out. The second man was someone who Sherry had known since a teenager and they had dated for several years. He said to the police that Sherry had commonly made up stories back then to gain attention, including accusing several members of her family of abuse. She even accused him of abuse after they broke up. Now this was some 15 years previously however, so a person could have changed, matured, moved on, or changed their behaviours in the intervening period. However, when police spoke to her first husband, he repeated some of the stories, which do start to paint a pattern that might indicate that this was a consistent part of Sherry's psychology. We heard earlier that DNA of an unknown male had been found on Sherry's clothes. Well, the affidavit lets us know that DNA had been found specifically on her underwear and a spot on her sweatpants. Now, we'll find out later that the DNA was actually a key part to cracking the whole case. But when the DNA was first checked, no match was identified on any database. Originally, when Sherry was found, she was unwilling to speak to police while she was in the hospital, so the police handed Keith, her husband, a tape recorder and asked him to ask Sherry what had happened. Now, this is how we got Sherry's original story of events, and her explanation for not wanting to speak with the police was because her abductors had told her that the buyer was a cop, and so she didn't know who she could trust. Captivity Sherry's recollection of the abduction once she had got into the SUV was as follows. Firstly, she said that she didn't see where the women took her because they wrapped something over her face. When Keith asked Sherry if her kidnappers put a bag over her head right away, Sherry responded, I don't remember. I don't know. I think she may have tased me. The next thing I remember is all my clothes were gone. Although she tried to stay awake during the drive, she kept falling asleep. Keith tried to get Sherry to describe the road trip after she was abducted. He asked her how long the trip took, whether she felt changes in altitude, what she could describe about the vehicle that she was in, and so on and so forth. Sherry said, I don't remember a lot. I'm missing time. The car smelled really bad, like sewage. She stuck me with something. I kept falling asleep. The older abductor liked to hit her and the younger one would yell at her in Spanish. Sherry described then waking up in a room on a bed. 
The bed was a plain mattress on the floor underneath a window. Sherry's body was across the mattress with her head towards the window and her feet hanging off the edge of the mattress. Sherry stated that her legs were no longer bound but that she had zip ties around her wrists. The room had a dresser in it along with the mattress but nothing else. The next thing Sherry remembered was breaking the zip ties off her wrists. There's zip ties together on my wrists. That's what this little scar is from. Now the interviewer noted that Sherry's zip tied arms moved from being bound behind her in the car to in front of her but Sherry couldn't explain how this happened. Sherry went on to explain that she and her husband had watched a YouTube video about how to break zip ties and then she tried that particular manoeuvre but it didn't work. Instead Sherry bit them and just chewed the hell out of them and then she broke them. The interviewer asked Sherry about the clothing she had on when she woke up in the room. Sherry said that she was wearing a plain t-shirt and her original underwear, no socks and no bra. Sherry didn't know what happened to her original clothing. Sherry said that after she got the zip tie off she stood on the bed and jumped up to pull the board off the window but there were also boards on the outside so she couldn't see outside. Sherry could not say whether the window could open. She was only able to get one board off before her abductors came into the room. When her abductors came into the room after she got the board off the window Sherry was pulled down from behind and hit very hard. Sherry described how she felt a burning feeling from her hair being pulled. She further described that she heard her abductors yelling as she came into the room. She couldn't remember where her body landed after her abductors pulled her down and she didn't see anything because all she saw was stars. The very next thing Sherry remembered was that she woke up in the room, the dresser was gone and the mattress was now where the dresser had been before and she had a chain around her waist. When asked Sherry said she didn't think about who would have abducted her and why, instead she was thinking about how she was going to get away. The next thing that happened after she woke up with the chain around her waist was that the door opened and a plate with food and a plastic bottle of water was put in the room and then the door shut. She described how she tried to manipulate her abductors to give her more information about why she was abducted including offering to clean and cook for them. However any time the younger abductor spoke to her the older woman hit her. She said that the woman put her in a closet with a bucket with kitty litter in it for her to use as a toilet and she described the closet as containing shelves and a metal pole to which the women hooked a cable and chain to with the other end of the chain hooked around her waist. There was enough length on it for Sherry to reach the bed but she couldn't reach the door. The chain was unmovable because it was bolted to the ceiling and Sherry described when she didn't listen to the women they would lock her in the closet. Sherry stated that there were boards on the windows of the room she was kept in. There was also some additional descriptions of her captivity location and her abductors. They would play music loudly, that really annoying Mexican music, and they would watch TV. There was a fireplace, I could smell it. I could hear that sound, you know, like when you move the handle to open the fireplace. It made a creaky sound. And it was cold. It was always cold. And it seemed like it rained almost every night. When she was asked if she ever heard anything distinct that might lead investigators to her abductors, she answered, I heard birds, I never heard anything else. They put the stereo right outside my door and played it super loud. Sherry described how her location was always cold and that her abductors would take her blankets away if she made any noise and she said there was no sexual abuse while she was in captivity. Her abductors fed us once a day, maybe rice or tortillas, and sometimes apples. However, if Sherry behaved, her abductors gave her some additional food. Sherry stated that many times her abductors gave her cream of wheat to eat and described how everything tasted horrible and was crap, or leftover crap. Sherry was also given a bottle of water. To give her meals, her abductors opened the door, put it in there, and slammed the door. Sherry described the first time her clothes were changed and this was after her first shower and she went on to describe the events that occurred when she was given this first shower. She explained that she was sitting on the bed in the room when her abductors came in to take her to the shower. They hit her on her head and hip but she doesn't know what she was hit with. 
The bigger one had her hair pulled back and a bandana around her face and the littler one had on a lacy mask. Both women had their guns and told Sherry not to struggle or move. Sherry later explained that the little one held a handgun that wasn't a revolver and the bigger one had a different gun that she always had either in her hands or in her pants. The abductors unlocked the chain and brought Sherry around the corner to a bathroom with water running. The little one stood at the door while the bigger one went back and forth in and out of the room. Sherry took her clothes off except for her underwear and used a coconut scented body wash that the bigger one threw at her to wash herself and her clothes. Sherry described the bathroom as being a small bathroom with a sink on the left, a towel rack on the right and a combined shower and tub with a cheap metal spigot, grey floor tiles and brown wall tiles and a crack in the shower tile. Sherry said that she tried to get her abductors to talk to her while she was in the shower and asked her abductors, where am I? Why am I here? But they didn't respond to her. The little one had a really thick accent and said, we sell you. The bigger one told Sherry, your buyer is a car. Then when the abductors were talking to each other, the bigger one said something to the little one and she turned her body and lowered her gun. At which point, Sherry jumped on her and shoved her face onto the toilet. Sherry explained that it was slippery and she slipped and cut her foot on the stupid side of the cabinet. The big one came in and dragged Sherry back into the bedroom by her hair and shoved a bit of liquid down Sherry's throat while she was choking and gagging. Sherry explained that then the abductors hit her, locked her back up and left the room. Sherry put on clothes that had been laid out on the bed and laid her underwear out to dry. Sherry described the closet, chain and pole. There are two doors that open outwards, two shelves and a really weird metal pole that looked like a large screw that went through both shelves, which is what the cable was attached to. Sherry said she liked being in the closet because it was warm and when the closet doors were shut, the chain hooked on the pole didn't make any noise that would alert her abductors so she was free to move and exercise. Sherry explained that although she was sore and hurt all the time, she needed to stay alert and wanted to stay strong so she would do yoga and move and stretch her legs. Also, if Sherry was outside of the closet, she would tuck the cable under her thigh and lift her other leg. Sherry also described how while she was in the closet, she took a screw and was trying to chip away at the drywall. She thought that if she could use the screw to chip at the drywall, she might be able to escape. If you remember when Sherry disappeared, she was wearing jogging clothes and when she returned, she was wearing grey sweatpants, a grey sweatshirt and her original underwear. During the interview, Sherry could not explain what happened to her original clothes. She said she fell asleep during the car ride after she was abducted and woke up in a room with different clothes on with no recollection of how her clothes came to be changed. Sherry stated, I didn't have any clothes, all I had left was my underwear which she let me wash when I took a shower. Sherry also stated that her abductors cut her hair and put an adult diaper on her. She also stated that she was branded after the first time she tried to escape. I tried to get out the first time and that's when she branded me. Her abductors brought a table in, hit her back and then tied her to the table. When they branded her, her skin made a sizzling popping sound and it was very painful. Later in the same interview, Sherry said that her abductors told her that her buyer wanted Sherry branded because that's what he liked. She was actually asked about the branding a second time but changed her story and said that this was on a later occasion and for making too much noise. When asked about the discrepancy, Sherry asked if tasing would mess with somebody's memory. She said she didn't remember much about the branding as she was face down and hurting from the still healing breast augmentation that she'd had recently. She thought the branding tool was small like a screwdriver and speculated that it could have been a crafting tool. Based on the descriptors that Sherry provided, investigators believed that she had been held in a mountainous location and focused efforts in higher areas of altitude. She'd lost a significant amount of weight by the time she returned, but in all of her subsequent interviews, Sherry never mentioned again being put in an adult diaper. She never heard a buyer's name because the abductors spoke mostly Spanish and Sherry didn't understand more than a few Spanish words. These included discussions about medicine, 
traffic cameras, a delivery date and a gamble, as well as Spanish insults directed at Sherry. When Sherry would take a shower, she was guarded by the younger abductor holding a gun. The abductors said that they were not supposed to hurt her and also mentioned getting paid. She couldn't remember much of the day she was returned. She heard the two women arguing in Spanish and Sherry believed that the younger abductor was saying that Sherry needed more medicine. Sherry heard what she believed was a gunshot and then said she could hear the younger one leave. Sherry said that the younger abductor was gone for a long time and Sherry was left alone in the house. She said after this she screamed and screamed and screamed until she fell asleep. She explained, I listened so carefully but it was all Spanish. I heard the word gambling. Sherry was asleep when the younger abductor came to get her to leave and it happened really fast and then Sherry was in the car and she believes a pillowcase was put over her head at some point but doesn't recall when or how. Sherry said that she tried hard to stay awake during the drive but it was hard for her to stay awake and she kept falling asleep. Sherry's abductor stopped the car and told Sherry to get out. Sherry explained that when the younger abductor dropped her off she clipped something off Sherry's arm that allowed Sherry to move her arm. Then the abductor sped off. Sherry's abductor was already far away by the time Sherry was able to pull the pillowcase off her head and she said that she ran to a church and banged on the door but nobody was there. She then ran to the freeway where she tried to flag down motorists. Eventually a truck driver stopped for Sherry and assisted her until the California Highway Police arrived. We heard Keith's story of events on the morning of the abduction and we heard Sherry's recollection of those events as follows. She took her kids to daycare, cleaned up around the house and had begun to wrap up a Christmas present for Keith. Now at approximately 11am Sherry sent a text message to Keith asking him to come home for lunch. Sherry joked with the detectives that Keith was embarrassed about the last text message Sherry sent him before she disappeared which she stated was along the lines of Honey, would you please come home to have sex with your wife for lunch? Since Keith wouldn't be able to come home for lunch, she decided to go for a run. She explained that she recently had a breast augmentation procedure and had just begun to heal enough to start jogging. She wanted to train for a local 5k race and had been using a cell phone app to help her train. She said that she almost always listened to her wedding song, Michael Bublé's Everything when she ran because it's a good pace keeper. Well, that might have been it. What we've heard about so far is put together from the three or four interviews Sherry had with interviewers over the months following her abduction. There were a couple of inconsistencies in her testimonies over some small things, like for example that while in the car her hands were zipped tied behind her back yet when she got out of them she talked about chewing them through because they were tied in front of her. Also the branding which was on one occasion punishment for trying to escape and on another occasion because she made too much noise. She also said that the abductors read out her details from articles saying that no one was looking for her because she had just run away. Whereas in another interview she said that they just told her about it. She said at one point that it was the older woman who told her that a cop was the buyer and another time it was the younger woman. But interestingly there were a couple of things she was extremely consistent with. There were the boards on the windows and the description of the bar in the small closet she was chained to. Now the reason for this consistency will become very apparent in due course. Over the next few years Sherry and Keith would contact the FBI from time to time with small details that Sherry would remember to try and help move the case along. At one point they produced a picture of what the table was like upon which she was held down while being branded. On another occasion she and Keith had produced a layout of the premises that she was held in. She said she could remember what a particular carpet looked like. Now these additional details didn't help with the investigation that much. Do you remember the DNA? Well in September 2019 the investigators took another look at the DNA found on Sherry's clothing and decided to look at familial DNA. Now that is where you don't just look for an exact match 
but you try to find close links that could potentially be family members related to the male source of the DNA. In March 2020, the investigators found a match with a man that was a potential relative of the source of the DNA. He had two sons, and guess what? One of those sons was an ex-boyfriend of Sherry. Investigators then looked through his trash and found a green tea bottle that was tested for DNA, and this gave an exact match to the DNA found on Sherry's clothing. They did some work looking at his social media profiles and found a picture of one of his rooms and in it was a coffee table that was extremely similar to the one that Sherry described and said she was branded on. Now this man was revealed as James Rays, a sports shop worker. He was interviewed on August the 10th, 2020 and at this point the whole story you've heard so far was exposed and Sherry's claims of an abduction crashed and burned. A different story. Now James' story was that he was with Sherry the whole time that she was supposedly kidnapped. They dated back when they were teens and even got engaged at one point but hadn't been in touch for years. He said he'd come across some old mementos and pictures of their time together and sent these to Sherry's parents to give to her. This was in around 2015. Sherry didn't take long after that before reaching out to him. She made claims to him that her relationship with Keith was abusive but that no one had done anything even though she'd reported him to the police. Now we now know that there are no records of Sherry ever having reported these allegations to anybody in any police department. They then planned for what happened next. James said that it wasn't very well thought out as while there was a plan for Sherry to escape the abusive relationship and the idea was for her to stay with him for a while, there was actually no plan on what would happen next. This is James' retelling of events. He had a friend rent a car for him in Southern California and then drove the 8-9 to nine hours to Reading where he waited in town until Sherry sent him a text saying it was time to meet up. Both James and Sherry had acquired burner phones for their correspondence and communication. He met her on a street that he couldn't remember but had the word old in it and she got in, lay on the back seat and then they drove to Costa Mesa to James' house. She apparently expressed some concern for her kids on the way but pretty much slept the whole time. She stayed inside his house for the whole time and sent James out to get her some clothes at one point. What happened after that? Well, he just got on with life and she stayed in the house. There were a couple of precautions though. While he slept on the couch, she stayed in the bedroom that was the least visible from outside. Apparently they weren't intimate. She hung out in the bedroom most of the time, although did some cleaning now and again. It is somewhat hard to believe, but apparently, according to his story, he wasn't aware of all the attention that the case was getting in the press. In that situation, to me, surely it would be hard not to have a laser focus on any reporting done in respect to the case. Sherry, he thought, might have known about the hoo-ha, because he said he saw her reading the news on the prepaid phone that she had. James didn't have a TV, so didn't see any reporting from that source. Now certain things start to knit together. Detectives who went through James' apartment realised that the floor pan matched the one that Sherry and Keith had provided them in their attempts to be helpful to the investigation. The closet in the bedroom she stayed in matched exactly the one Sherry described as being tied up in. James was asked if anything was done in the room that Sherry spent most of her time in. He told them that Sherry had asked him to board up the windows at one point. Now this wasn't a detail that was in the public arena, so added credibility that James' story was truthful. Remember all those details relating to those parts of Sherry's story that remained consistent throughout the interviews? The inconsistent parts of her stories were the ones that were fabricated. But what about all those injuries she had when she turned up after the abduction? She had the weight loss, the injuries some of which were healing, the branding etc. This wasn't all done just the day before she decided to reappear. The branding, don't forget, was on her shoulder. So how could she do that from behind? 
There's more to this, surely. Well, yes there was. James told the detectives that most of the injuries were in fact self-inflicted. She'd eaten very little in the time that they were together, saying that she wanted to lose weight and cut her own hair. However, James did help with some of her injuries, for example hitting a puck into her leg, which he did, but he said he did lightly. And the branding? Well, James admitted he did it, but said that this was at her request. He'd bought a wood-burning craft kit and tried to brand her, with something that was apparently meaningful to her, but he couldn't remember what. This though was critical because nowhere in the press had there been any mention of the branding being of any words, so he must have been there when it happened to know this fact. He also knew about a rash that she had that had never been made public and said that he'd bought some cream for her to help her with it. Just before Thanksgiving, Sherry told him that she'd been missing her kids and had decided to return. She took everything she owned in the house and threw it in the dumpster. James' friend rented him another car and he took her to the side of the road where he left her and she was subsequently found. She bound herself in the car and threw her burner phone out of the window. He said he kept quiet afterwards for fear he'd be arrested and he'd made a pact with himself however that if any law enforcement turned up on his doorstep he would cooperate, which he did. He confirmed that at no stage were any other women involved in the hoax. The aftermath. So what are we to believe? Was Sherry abducted and was James the perpetrator or was this an elaborate hoax? It is clear that he must have been involved as he knew too much for him not to have been involved. But could he have actually lured Sherry and then been her abductor? Well there are things that back up his side of the story. In particular James actually had somebody who could back him up. He'd told his cousin in the months leading up to the abduction what he'd planned, and his cousin had helped him keep people like the maintenance man away from his house during the time that Sherry was there. And yes, he'd actually seen her there, once looking out of a window, and on another occasion when he'd entered in the house, she was actually in the living room. Apparently when she saw him, she ran into the bedroom. Another fact that lends credibility to James' story as being the true version is that investigators actually confronted Sherry with it directly. She flat out said that James didn't abduct her. Now that was her opportunity to throw him under the bus so to speak if she wanted, but she flat out refused. So a few days after interviewing James, the FBI interviewed Sherry again in the company of Keith. They asked her about the story again, and again she told them her original story of abduction. They had a photo, however, of the coffee table, you know, the one that she said she was held down on and branded, and that had been provided to detectives. They then showed her James' coffee table, which was similar. At this point, she said it was too long for her to remember. Now, at this point, remember, we are about four years after the incident. They had more photos this time of James' apartment, and while showing her these, they pointed out the similarities between it and the description she had given. She admitted that yes, there were similarities, but it was a bit different. They put it to her that this was the place that they knew she'd been staying at, and they'd spoken to the family who knew she was there. What was her reply? Oh my God. There was some discussion over whether she still wanted Keith to be there while they talked, and after she talked separately to Keith, they resumed from where they'd left off. The only way to proceed from here, they said, would be for her to start telling them the truth. Now, she continued to try to lie, saying that she didn't want her abductor, who released her, to get into trouble, as she was the only reason she gets to see her children every day. They said that they knew she hadn't been kidnapped and that the DNA belonged to James. She just kept to the story. She denied talking to James, for example, but when presented with contradictory evidence from her phone and the burner phones, and after Keith had left the room, and after being reminded it was a crime to lie to a federal officer, she admitted speaking to him. She did keep insisting, however, that she'd been kidnapped.
conclusion? Well, Sherry was arrested on the 3rd of March 2022 and charged with firstly making false statements to a federal officer and secondly mail fraud. Now the latter was due to the fact that the monies received from the GoFundMe source, which amounted to around $50,000, was received and then paid into Sherry and Keith's own account and used for various personal expenses. These two charges between them could have a maximum fine of $500,000 and 25 years in jail. On the day she was arrested, her husband Keith left her and has since filed for divorce and is looking for custody of their two children. Six weeks after her arrest, she eventually signed a plea deal admitting that she had orchestrated the hoax. She apologized and released a statement saying, I am deeply ashamed of myself for my behavior and so very sorry for the pain I've caused my family, my friends, all the good people who needlessly suffered because of my story and those who worked so hard to try and help me. I will work for the rest of my life to make amends for what I have done. Sherry will be sentenced on July the 11th, 2022. I hope you found this update informative and at the time of publishing this video, we're about two weeks away from Sherry's sentencing. Let me know what you think that might be in the comments below. Please like the video and if you hit that subscribe button and then the notification bell, you won't miss out on future videos when they're published. Bye for now.